Ever since the original Call of Duty hit the shelves back in 2003, the series has gone through several phases. Starting off humble in World War II, before milking that dry and moving to a modern setting, before milking that dry and advancing to the future and beyond eventually returning back to its roots, and most recently, revisiting the setting and namesake that launched this franchise into mainstream popularity. Love it, hate it, or loved it and now hate it, Call of Duty is here to stay. It always amazes me just how consistently popular the franchise has been given its annual release. And with 16 major installments, well, the road has had a few potholes. It might be hard for the youngins out there to imagine this, but... I remember when Call of Duty campaigns were something that most people who bought the game actually played. Having gone in depth and reviewed nearly every title in the series besides these, I thought it was the perfect time to look at Call of Duty campaigns as a whole and reflect on what has made some of them so awesome, others so bad, and just a couple so mediocre. But what are the most memorable Call of Duty missions? And why? Which story and cast of characters resonated with people the most? What makes a great Call of Duty campaign? Well, let's break out of Vorkuta, take out those fucking PT boats, and get all gillied up straight into this. But before we jump straight into it, Frag Pro Shooter is the sponsor of today's video. This free-to-play mobile shooter has over 30 million players. Destroy the two enemy bunkers, gain access to the tower, destroy that, and celebrate your hard-earned victory. Collect up to 80 different characters, each with a specific role and playstyle, emphasizing defense or attack. Build your team of five crack commandos, swap between them at will, as you run and gun from a first or third person perspective. With the new 2v2 mode, you and a friend or rando can team up and teabag your enemies. But wait, there's more. Courtesy of your boy, using the link in the description will grant you free rewards, including a gold chest, 500 coins, and 50 diamonds. So go do it. Click that sexy link in the description and install Frag Pro Shooter today. Thank you, Frag, for sponsoring this video. Now let's get on with it. Yes, get on with it! The value and enjoyment you get out of any COD campaign is going to be entirely subjective. Heck, I've read comments from people saying they liked Ghost's campaign or thought Black Ops 3 had a great story. I have a hard time believing that, but still, no judgment. Whether you love battling on the sands of Normandy, defending Burger Town to your dying breath, or signing on with Atlas Corporation, we can pretty much divide the value of a campaign into two basic categories, story and gameplay. Occasionally, the greatness of a single player can be entirely independent from the quality of the multiplayer. Sometimes an overall crappy campaign can surprise you with an exceptional mission or two. On the other hand, a great campaign can sometimes be plagued by a couple horrendous levels. So we're going to take a look at some notable examples of levels, design, sandbox, etc. to determine when Call of Duty has knocked it out of the park and when it's taken a fat L. Loser! You're a loser! The more COD campaigns I've played, the more I've realized just how similar they can be, which is great for fans who want a familiar experience and for newbies to the franchise. But for an old salty sea dog like Act Man, I need something innovative. Maybe the campaigns had gotten so repetitive that's why Treyarch didn't even bother with Black Ops 4. Heh <laughs> heh, welcome to Black Ops 4, kiddo. Wait till you see... Alright, everyone's gone already. COD has always struggled to please everyone, and I at least recognize that my experience has shaped my expectations which often doesn't fall in line with what the developers are seeking to create. Modern Warfare 2019 switched things up quite a bit, but COD's formula has been pretty standard for a long time. You got your set pieces, your linear paths, on-rails turret sections, stealth missions. At some point a guy is going to yell out, RPGs! RPGs! 
So you're gonna shoot a helicopter or two out of the sky. Main character you may or may not have cared about will be killed off. Obligatory defense mission, quick time events. We've seen it all before. With so many games, the amount of new things COD can do is limited. But it's when Call of Duty strays away from the tropes and cliches we are so familiar with that I find the most enjoyment. Modern Warfare 2019 should be commended simply for daring to have the player do things other than constantly shooting. It arguably has the widest variety of gameplay in the series. But let's start with the thing every Call of Duty developer fears above all else. New Dog Models the most overlooked feature of COD campaigns are the dog models. You really can't have an immersive or groundbreaking story without them. By having high resolution scans of an actual SEAL Team s Linearity versus open-endedness. For classic shooters back in the day, games like Duke Nukem, Doom, Half-Life, and even Combat Evolved often had puzzle-like level design. There was a lot of downtime after a battle as you looked for that hidden switch that opened the next area. But as gaming in the FPS genre started to become more mainstream and popular, so too did shooters become more strictly linear. Linearity in COD was important because it allowed players to enjoy the experience at a pace set by the developers. It is impossible to get lost in some of these levels, and so technically everyone can complete a COD campaign. But that doesn't mean everyone can enjoy it. Despite always maintaining an M rating and apparently being made for people 17 and older, the series tends to employ aspects of game design that a toddler could figure out. And to be quite honest, the series beat the linear horse to death years ago. Oh boy, another on rails vehicle section with all the interaction of a Kinect game as I'm stuck on a single path that ain't half as fun or complex as a goddamn Star Fox 64 mission. That's no good. What's this, a large group of enemies marching towards me? I'd better go prone and wait for them to pass. Uh-oh, this cutscene doesn't have any interactive elements. Throw in a quick time event. Usually you can sum up the level design as, here you are at point A, follow this single path that you cannot get lost on until you get to point B. You're always going to have point A and point B, but I can't tell you how refreshing it is to have a level where point B can be accessed in like five different ways. Let's look at some examples of the best missions that are not so linear. Sentinel from Advanced Warfare is such a kick-ass mission and an otherwise forgettable experience. While earlier levels gave you mechanics and then tossed them aside, this is one out of two instances where the player is allowed to fully utilize the sandbox without restriction. Maneuvering with the grapple hook tagging enemies to monitor their positions, watching out for drones. Is it just me or would Advanced Warfare have been 10 times better if 80% of the missions were this open? While it may be a cardinal sin to say anything good about ghosts, I do appreciate a good defense section. And Clockwork has one of the few sections I actually enjoyed from this game, where you can set up your defenses however you want, turrets, shockwave claymores, mines, it's an awesome location to fight in as guys come pouring in from all sides. Although Modern Warfare 2 does this way better with the estate defense and loose ends. A much more dynamic location. Versatility and options. How can the player approach any given situation? That's what's really important. The new Modern Warfare is filled with open-ended level design, and this firefight in Piccadilly gives you the freedom to roam around and rescue civilians in any order you please. Almost the entire mission is open to you right from the get-go, with the added risk of civilians being executed which adds some additional tension. Same thing applies to Embedded. You gotta plant charges in three different areas, sneak quietly, go in loud, do it however you damn please. Isn't it surprising how much more fun it is when you give players freedom of choice and which objectives they tackle? Second mission of combat evolved anyone? But the pinnacle of awesome non-linear design is found in Black Ops 2. Where else would it be? Every optional mission gives you the ability to move troops around, take control of any one of them at any time. The number of ways you can approach these levels is seemingly limitless. I've never had this type of fun from COD, nor expected to ever experience it. There are even hidden caches of weapons you could find to upgrade your arsenal, and that was rewarding players for their exploration, something that Call of Duty routinely discourages with the sheer amount of invisible barriers. And you can't walk that way, bitch. 
Infinite Warfare also dabbled in optional missions, and I can't underemphasize how refreshing it is to just be given the option to choose the next level. Call of Duty has historically focused way more on safe one-dimensional level design, but when it experiments with non-linearity, that's when the franchise surprises you. That's when the developers are confident enough to let go of your hand and allow you to walk across the street on your own. One final example, COD World War II is plagued by terrible, predictable writing, brain-dead layouts, and is likely the most disappointing game in the franchise, for me. However, there is one level that I will always remember. Liberation tasks you with sneaking into a German base to plant explosives, but you also have these dialogue options and choosing the right one will grant you access. And honestly, it's just so much fun to explore this Nazi base. This was the first and only time I was genuinely excited playing COD World War II for how different this mission was. It's great to be able to look at the more unique levels in Call of Duty games. Even though the horse mechanics and old wounds are kinda dodgy, jumping on that horse and running wherever the hell you want was just awesome. Now even if a level is mostly linear, simply opening up the landscapes offering multiple paths to the same objective can do wonders for immersion and fun. Blood and Iron from World at War is a very basic vehicle level, not the greatest, but you have tons of room to maneuver your tank around, letting you see enemies from far away and allowing engagements from all distances. On the other hand, collateral damage in COD World War II is painfully claustrophobic, and after playing this mission I felt like my intelligence was being called into question by Sledgehammer. But now let's switch our focus to what Call of Duty is more known for. While linear design isn't inherently boring, how it's handled is the deciding factor. Scripted sequences can become extremely powerful and engaging when done right as witnessed in shock and awe with the nuclear blast. The scene is made more powerful just by giving players control over how they crawl. That's immersive. Same thing with Revelations in Black Ops 1. Essentially, not a mission at all, but it's one of the best scripted sequences this franchise has ever seen, because its entire goal was to tell a story. We are brothers, Mason. We are the same. You could pretty much look at basically every mission from COD 4 and see an amazing scripted sequence. But when done poorly, you'd rather spend 15 years in the gulag than sit in a tank doing nothing for one more minute. Clean House is the perfect example. You could seriously make a short indie type game based solely on this level's setup and layout. While the path and outcome is the same, every encounter is so unique, detailed, and well thought out that it's chilling. It's not about shooting 8,000 guys in a row with a giant minigun, but rather shooting a handful of guys precisely while in close quarters. Now, arguably the best level in COD history is all Gilly Duck. Putting you into the role of Captain Price as a stealthy sniper was a stark contrast to the more loud and bombastic missions that came before. But it's also amazing because you can play through the entire thing without being detected. Except for the helicopter. It always bugged me with stealth missions in later CODs because they would often give up the facade and end up going loud partway through. I felt cheated out of an experience that I could have had. But all gillied up is a stealth fan's dream. Crawling under jeeps, taking down other snipers, eliminating groups of enemies, watching them just shoot the shit with each other, sneaking past armies of troops. If every linear level in COD single players had this amount of polish and thought put into it, there wouldn't be a single bad COD campaign out there. More important is the pacing and buildup of the combat. In all gillied up, you have the advantage of secrecy and can take your time surveying the area. Pacing is one of the most underrated aspects of game design, and it's definitely an area this series needs to focus more on. Though I love Modern Warfare 2 with all my heart, I cannot stand takedown. Soon as you jump down this ledge, Infinity Ward flips the switch and BAM! Non-stop clusterfuck of gunfire, grenade spam, bad guys surrounding you from all directions, flailing their AK-47s in the air, tons of buildings and windows to check, it's a nightmare. Meanwhile, in Dust to Dust, Modern Warfare 3, the pacing is hard and fast. You're given a juggernaut suit and buttloads of guys to destroy. It creates this feeling of intensity. Having things to shoot 
is not the only thing that makes a shooter fun, but the build up to those encounters. If you don't know what I'm talking about, play Bioshock. World at War nails this in the first level Semper Fi. You're in the jungle, about to be executed, rescued, it's time to tear this place apart, and then you're infiltrating the Japanese bases, and they will use every tactic in the book to take you by surprise. The Japanese in World at War fight entirely different than any other faction in the franchise, relying on guerrilla and stealth tactics to take you down. Just when you think it's going to be a dialogue section, Looks like a temple or some shit. Banzai! Oh, is this another dialogue section? No, of course not! How about now, are we good? Where's the plot headed? Banzai! World at War continually surprises the player with these encounters, even though they are totally scripted and linear. Now, I want to talk about linear missions that are more in service of the story, but first let's take a look at when the linear design does a disservice to the game. Story-wise, No Russian kicks off the entire conflict of Modern Warfare 2, showing off a gruesome massacre. But gameplay? Yeah, it's a big old turd in the toilet. They couldn't have made you walk any faster, dude. What the fuck? There's gotta be like 5 million cops on their way. Can we speed this up a little bit? Being forced to walk at a snail's pace is probably one of the most frustrating things about video games in general. And then we have D-Day and COD World War II. Oh fuck yeah, we hadn't seen something like this since the early days. After a promising start, the mission heads into the trenches. But rather than have a unique network of paths like you'd expect from trenches in World War II, the developers just put you on one. One single path. Surrounded by invisible barriers, bam, immersion shattered. The bulk of advanced warfare is ruined by its restrictive design. Imagine the possibilities for unique level design with the mag gloves and the grapple hook, allowing players to scale buildings? Nah bro, our audience is too stupid to figure that out on their own. Just tell them when to use it and leave it at that. There's one mission later on that gives you a giant playground to mess around in. Why are Call of Duty developers so afraid of this type of design? Come to think of it, many scripted sequences in later games neither improve the storytelling nor offer interesting gameplay, but are almost always there. There's far too many to list, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But Black Cats does it right. A seemingly straightforward on-rails section is made more dynamic by having the player rotate to different guns on the plane, at will, depending on where the ships are. So hopefully I've given you a wide variety of examples to look at. When I think about my favorite Call of Duty missions, the ones that come to mind either have really unique level design, interesting gimmicks, or they have great storytelling in a linear environment. Not every level has to be a set path, nor does it need to be an immense labyrinth. It's all about striking the right balance between engaging scripted sequences and freedom of choice, variety. Black Ops 2 did it best, with Modern Warfare 2019 right behind, and it's no wonder why those two are my favorite campaigns in the series. While level design and sandbox is most important from the perspective of, you know, a video game, to go that next level, you need a dope-ass soundtrack and theme to amplify the experience and really stick it into people's memory. An absent or lackluster soundtrack can bore you to death. Who could forget trying to find Karma in the club as Skrillex blasted in the background, which was then supplemented by chaotic gunfire, dodging in slow-mo. God, that beat was funky. Vendetta begins with the most somber, depressing music pieces in all of COD, and highlights the gruesome acts the Third Reich has committed. I could listen to General Shepard give his speeches over same shit different day like it's a goddamn podcast. And when you listen to the triumphant score of the Russians in World at War, how could you not become a communist? Even World War II had a couple of dope tracks with the heroically patriotic main theme. I 
I find that if I don't remember anything from the soundtrack, the campaign itself is usually pretty forgettable. The Modern Warfare games, Black Ops 1 and 2, World at War, all have phenomenal soundtracks that solidify the style of those games. And that's what the music is supposed to do. Capture the tone and create a memorable sequence of events. Now you might be thinking, why is a mission like Vorkuta way more engaging and fun than a mission like all of Black Ops 3? Well, beyond game design, it comes down to the story and characters. How are they written? What's the chemistry between them? What are they fighting for or against? What is the objective? In Black Ops 3, you've got your thumb up the ass the entire game, following the trail of this guy Hendrix, who you barely know anything about, because he killed a few people and... God, it sucks. You don't really feel invested in this tale of revenge because the protagonist is so separated from it and has no personal stake in it. Compare that with the revenge story of Black Ops 2, and your first encounter with Menendez creates a personal connection between you and him. Now when you look at Vorkuta, oh my god, is it a mission packed with content. Every journey begins with a single step. This is step one! Security! Gotta follow the seven steps to freedom. The level has you escape from a Russian prison, teaming up with other inmates to start a revolution, skewering the winged beast, stealing weapons, as Reznov gives passionate speeches about brotherhood and unity. There's an exciting chase sequence. Good God, Black Ops 1 needs to have like a movie adaptation. Throughout, Reznov plays a pivotal role and is always there to help you out. You know, characters need to be relatable and have humanity. These games are about war, so we also need compelling motivations of the factions and people involved in that war. Dragovich, Kravchenko, Stein. These men must die. For instance, while the idea of a federation of South American countries rising up to take over North America is interesting, I ain't got a damn clue why they did that in Ghosts. Or in AW, why does Hades hate technology? Who knows? Who cares? Without any sort of compelling motivation, our villains have no depth. A great supporting character or villain can elevate the story to new heights. Makarov is such a badass in Modern Warfare 3. What happens here today will change the world forever. Always seeming one step ahead, always able to outsmart his opponents, and when his backstory is fleshed out, revealing that he was responsible for the nuke in COD 4, it ties the whole trilogy together, makes it that much more satisfying to see him hanged. Taking a page from Marty O'Donnell, emotional equity is important. The time and love we've spent investing in characters over a series of games over a period of time cannot be neglected. Because Ghosts and Black Ops 3 and Advanced Warfare and Infinite Warfare are all disconnected from the rest of the series, we don't have that emotional equity. That's the reason why Soap McTavish, Captain Price are such beloved characters, because we've seen them go through so much shit. Back to villains, Raul Menendez is a scary mofo, out for blood and revenge. You betrayed us, Farid. And for what? Yet the way the story is told, you can't help but feel a little sorry for him and his tragic tale. He's also completely out of his mind. Dragovich, Kravchenko, and Steiner are hell-bent on instigating World War III with America. And again, emotional equity. If Dragovich and the others gassed a bunch of random Russian soldiers, that's nowhere near as emotional as him killing one of the protagonists of the previous game, Dmitry Petrenko. You can sum up Dragovich's character in a single section at the end. Even facing his demise, he has the balls to make fun of you. I can make you kill my own president! Right? These are compelling villains. They drive the player's actions, create the conflict, evoke emotion. A poorly written bad guy will suck all the tension and stakes out of the story. 
Rourke's shenanigans are totally unbelievable. It's comical the way in which he and you escape captivity. Jonathan Irons started off promising, but then turned into a over-the-top cartoony supervillain. It's also important for Call of Duty campaigns to have some kind of unique storytelling. Black Ops 1 dabbled in portraying the protagonist, Alex Mason, as somewhat of a villain too. The biggest pitfall COD campaigns fall into is being more focused on the plot than its characters. And that's when I lose interest. When you're trying to establish how awful this group of people or person is, if you tell me they killed a million people, it's not half as interesting as showing them kill one person in front of me. When the logistics of combat and, oh, what are we doing? Where's the plane going? I don't know. It's going to Alpha Base. What are we going to do once we get to Alpha Base? We're going to infiltrate the... <laughs> Just that garbage dialogue. That crap overshadows character development. And that's what defines, to me, a forgettable COD campaign. It's the difference between why you love every line from Captain Price and his glorious mustache and not Sergeant What's-His-Face. It's why you care about Woods and not Will Irons. It's why I was never invested in the stories of Ghosts, Black Ops 3, and Advanced Warfare. On a side note, I couldn't make this video without discussing Black Ops 2's amazing branching narrative. In-game choices that affected the outcome is something you expect from a Bioware game. And the COD series should have continued this trend. I mean, these decisions aren't easy to make. They put you on the spot. And sometimes the option that seems the best in the moment can have severe consequences later on, leading you to question what really is the best path. The more elusive the best ending, the more people will want to see it. Having the most extreme case of good and bad outcomes to the story was so freaking awesome. I can't even put it into words. I spent hours watching all the various cutscenes and it amazes me that this sequence in Judgment Day can play out in like 15 different ways. No! It adds so much depth to the story and the characters when their fates are totally up to you. And then there's plot twists. An epic, well-done twist can blow the player's mind and make them reflect on everything that's happened. Except when that twist isn't even directly relayed to the player and you have to take a screenshot of flying text to figure that out. Like, God damn it, Treyarch. This twist could be anything like a huge disaster, a monumental betrayal, a shocking revelation, or the death of a main character. These moments, when built up to, can separate a memorable campaign from a forgettable one. Damn it! Why can't you remember? Draw out sympathy and establish that emotional connection. We've sent a strong message to this attack, Makarov. That was no message. <laughs> this is a message. But while a tragic twist and relatable interesting characters are necessary, they don't automatically make a good story. For all its successes, Modern Warfare 2019 tried way too hard to shock the player. Do we really need to see children being murdered to understand the severity of the situation? And if you don't have comic relief in these games, don't even bother. I wouldn't trade Soap and Price's witty banter for all the loot boxes and infinite warfare. Going back to cliches and familiarity, don't you get instantly tired when the new Call of Duty game regurgitates the same type of plot? Alright guys, we gotta craft a new story. Who should the bad guys be? I'm thinking like space aliens- Russians! Just do Russians again! Alright ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna revisit World War II. There's so many angles and perspectives we can look at this from. I think we should- Nope! Only Americans versus Germans! That's all that mattered! I mean, thank God we had an American bad guy in Modern Warfare 2. And having some kind of historical connection to real life events can also be a plus and make the story instantly relatable. Walking through Pentagon security to see the war room and arrive at a super secret meeting with JFK, that was incredible. And World at War did a fantastic job showcasing the brutality of war, a mark that COD World War II missed entirely. Story and cutscenes in Call of Duty campaigns are way more important than people make them out to be. 
They need to be complex, with motivations, personality. I'll never forget my adventures alongside Reznov as Dmitry Petrenko, or listening to the smooth, sexy voice of Ghost over the comms, working with Captain Macmillan to take out Zakaev. I'll never forget the witty Captain Price or the cruel and spiteful Menendez. If the campaign is fun, great. But interesting characters and a unique plot that I was invested in are what I'm going to remember when all is said and done. So what exactly separates an awesome Call of Duty campaign from a bad and forgettable one? Well, if there's anything you can take away from this video, I think this franchise creates the most memorable go away experiences when they, not you, push the boundaries of familiarity. The developers should aim to create a perfect balance between awesome story-driven linear sequences and non-linear missions that put control in the player's hands. As a rule of thumb, the less restrictive a COD campaign is, oftentimes the more enjoyable it is. Especially for a franchise notorious for its predictable, formulaic, safe design, Call of Duty campaigns are at their best when they surprise you. Which is always the thing you least expect from this series. And that is what makes a Call of Duty campaign so awesome, or so bad, or so forgettable. Victory cannot be achieved without sacrifice, Mason. We rush.